Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, you know what? We're going to start a new book today. It's titled Exodus. And I feel that uh, each time I teach this book, it um, brings to mind and causes us to remember this is, when, this is the way God delivered his children. You know what? It's going to happen again. This is only a type. This is how you come out of Babel and how you come out of confusion, is to listen to your father. The word exodus from the Septuagint being in the Greek means the going out or the way out. And of course, you know what the way out of Babylon confusion is. Christ is the way. And, but we had types in Joseph and in Genesis, and we'll have a type here of Savior, which will be, uh, of course, Moses. Now, what is it actually a book of? It's a book of redemption. It's where God redeems his people. But there is one thing I want you to really let settle into your mind. I mean, let me just say it the country way. You get it down in your head real good that God had it planned long before it happened. And we're going to open Exodus by going back to Genesis chapter 15. And we're going to read verses 13 and 14 to show you that God had already planned when he told them they would... Abram, before he even became Abraham, what would happen to the children? And it reads, just so you know, Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, before the fact, before the captivity, uh, he speaks to them in verse 13, and he said unto Abram, this would be Abraham, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And of course, that was the captivity in Egypt. Verse 14 reads, And also that nation whom they shall serve, Egypt that is, will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. In other words, even while in captivity, they're going to be blessed. They're going to grow even while they're there. Uh, let that settle in your mind that God knows what he's doing before the fact, and he's written you a letter informing you of all the details. I just wonder how well you've read it. But there, there's no excuse for there to be surprises in this generation especially, because these were set forward only as types so that you would know exactly how it would come to pass as we move out of confusion, the captivity, uh, and naturally, what is, the, what is Satan's main tool? What would Christ say every time he warned you, don't be deceived? Well, it's deception. Make sure that you uh, have your mind loaded and locked with truth, that is to say, with the seal of God, which is his word, whereby you're not deceived. Learn to think for yourself, act for yourself, and listen carefully to what is written. And I'm going to tell you something that is a trap of Satan. You have many traditions of men that some people have heard since they were children, uh, key slogans and so forth, and fly away and uh, junk. And when you come to a certain place, if you're not careful, your mind will insert the traditions which makes this letter void rather than actually following the subject and the object. So learn to read for yourself. Now, I'm going to say something that will insult some, but that doesn't bother me a great deal. Many of you that then would study for yourself and run to some revolving rev uh, and ask him for verification, don't do that. I mean, he's not studied. He must stick with the traditions, or he doesn't have a retirement, a job, or anything else. 
And quite frankly, someone that studies God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, someone that possesses a simple Strong's Concordance, which I highly recommend as a study tool, and puts a year or two in God's Word, you're getting a good start and you're well above the average Bible thumper. Understand what I said? There are some good scholars, a few, that teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but they're far and few in between. So learn to think for yourself. Otherwise, you're in a cult. I don't care what hinge flies over the door. If, if you allow them to do your thinking for you and you never crack the book, you're in a cult. And um, because most likely, uh, uh, you might say, well, how can you say that? Because any man or woman of God will insist I repeat, insist that the student grow very familiar and skilled in the letter that God has written to them personally. Well, they're just making friends and influencing people here. What? Uh, and that might, in, as I say, it might irritate some for a statement like that. But think for yourself. And I, I'm going to say something else. You're not going to have that revolving rib standing between you and God on Judgment Day because God has sent you the letter personally. He has given you a mind to think with. If you don't use it, I'm sorry. I pretty well can tell you where you're going. I won't because we've got a long ways to go and people can make up for a lot of lost time. But if you don't think for yourself, you have no excuse. You won't be able to ask someone else. So you had better get your homework done, and you had better do it well. Exodus, the going out, the way out. Do you know the way out of confusion? You should have a good life even today. There are many people that are very far already on the road out of confusion and into truth. How are you doing? Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. They went into captivity. Every man in his household came with Jacob. Now, the Hebrew name for the book you find in that first sentence in the words, these are the names, okay? It is the Ele Shemot, which is to say in the names. And it's important because it, the, where you're going to hear the tribes their migration, but also you're going to find it has a great deal to do with names and as much as in the uh, 15th chapter, I believe it is, you're going to start being acquainted with the sacred name. That is to say the name of God and that is the way. Ele Shimon, the names. Verse 2, here they are, Reuben, Simon, uh, Simeon, rather, Levi, and Judah. And Reuben, of course, was the oldest. Verse 3, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin. Verse 4, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Verse 5, and all the souls, <clears throat> excuse me, that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. He was already there. His brothers sold him, remember? Verse 6, And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation, they died. So we've gone past the patriarchs, so to speak, that is to say, the founders of each of the tribes. And it's important that you know that those tribes have migrated. Most people keep up basically with the tribe of Judah, but they forget the rest. They just kind of write them off. Uh, well, uh, I, thought, I thought they were all of Judah. Of course not. That's ridiculous. Think. Think for yourself. That's why the house of Israel and the house of Judah were divided, separated. I guess God knew a lot of people would be lazy thinkers. So keep up with both houses. 
The houses of Israel uh, passed over the Caucasus Mountains. Later they were called Caucasians, settled Europe. Many later over into the Americas here. And naturally, that would be basically the Christian nations of the end times, the house of Israel. And our brother Judah, fantastic. Keep up with him as well, but um, whatever you do, don't lose um, the ten tribes that went north. Verse 7 as we continue. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. I mean, this is quite a thing. I mean, while you're in captivity, that uh, you're multiplied. Why? God promised it. I read it. To, we read it together from Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. God knew before they went there, I'm going to bless them. They're going to become very prosperous. So here, though, you have um, a bunch of slaves, and they're doing better than you are as far as health is concerned, and that wouldn't have been any big step because all of the Israelites were having to work, even the women, and uh, they were muscular, well-shaped, strong, tough, can-do type people. Why? They worked. This is, that's very simple. You know, it's not difficult to keep up with. Verse 8 why they were so healthy and why they did so well. They didn't have to worry about having a Nordic track or something else for exercise, all right? They, they got all they needed. Verse 8, now there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. Of course, this would probably be as thought by most scholars, Ramesses II, and that's probably true. Um, but um, there, there were many kings and someday I'm going to do a special on shepherd kings if I haven't already. It escapes my mind, the Hyksos, but who knows? We'll see. Maybe it's time to do an update or something. Verse 9. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. And you know, when they're your slaves and you've conquered them, that's something to think about. If they're stronger and more, they can kick uh, kick your chief pretty easy and not have to ask too many questions. That could be a dangerous situation if there were an uprising, all right? And where you've got these people that are tall, brawny, they're strong, muscular, can-do type people, and you got a lot of these over here that it's obvious they spend a lot of time on the oasis drinking um, palm juice under the... Um, the uh, date tree, okay? I mean, there you can look at them and tell, you know, they're not in very good shape. Verse 10, come on, let us deal wisely with them. Let, let's be very diplomatic about the situation, the Hebrew would say. Lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, uh, they join also against our enemies, also our, our enemies, unto our enemies, it should, I should say, and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. I mean, we got a good thing going here. They were having everything built by these people. They were good workers. They could sure turn out the brick. And um, so we said we, we need to be very careful if they join with another enemy to fight us, we're hard pressed. But let's be very diplomatic about it. In other words, usually if you have a people under pressure, they are usually not accounted as intelligent enough to have figured these things out for themselves. Verse 11, therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities. By Tom, that, that would be to say the... Um, the storehouse city, okay? That's where the excess stores were kept. And uh, Ramesses, and of course, um, uh, Patum would be the city of the god of Tum, but this was their storehouse. The Greeks would give it, uh, let's see, what would they call this? They would call this city uh, Hero Heroopolis, 
which uh, basically means storehouse in, Ram in the Greek, uh, Septuagint, and the uh, Ramesses, of course, um, the child of the sun, okay? And the city was built by uh, Ramesses, okay? Verse 12, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. The tougher they worked them, the tougher they got, okay? More able, more capable, stronger. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And, and really, I don't want you to lose, I, I'm bringing some of the natural things uh, into play here, but don't concentrate on them totally. Naturally, a people that works hard, you don't have all the disease that you have. Uh, uh, you know, so many people have bad stomach problems and so forth. Well, a lot of times, you know, uh, and of course there are exceptions to every rule, but the stomach needs more exercise than any of the rest of your body because there's all kinds of things going on and through there. And if you just kind of lean over and hump and compress them, they can hardly work, you know. It just really stuff just gobs up, all right? But now all you got to do is get up and, and be a little vivacious and, and circulate and hey, God's got us some room there and things just go good. Well, I'm not going to, maybe I'm digressing here a little bit, but I, uh, we, that's the natural order of things and that's why they were doing so well. But whatever you do, I would be at fault if I were to cause you to forget that God is blessing them. And naturally, one of the easiest ways for God to bless is to maintain that that is natural functioning these bodies as he created them to function, causing the Egyptians to put them in that situation where there was no choice other than to be healthy. All right? So, but, but God, at the same time, I don't want to take away from the fact that it was already written they would prosper in this place. I don't know. Yah, our Father, is certainly multiplying their thoughts. Has he yours? How are you doing? Verse 13. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with riga. Pirk in the Hebrew. That, that means um, uh, crushingly. I mean, they, they really worked them. 14. And naturally, what's the outcome? Uh, why do you think that young men that weigh, that are 97 pound weak ones, join the United States Marine Corps, and they feed them well and work them like you don't know what work is, and they get tougher every day? And they come out uh, well formed, tough, can do type people because they are put through a rigorous training that most people would not believe that those people were capable of doing. But discipline added to that that is natural makes pretty good people, okay? So uh, it didn't hurt then, that's the point, okay? Verse 14, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. That was, they weren't nice to them. Now, you're going to find out as we go through that the Egyptians, though people put them up as quite tough taskmasters, did not to discipline themselves as well as some had to discipline themselves because uh, quite frankly, as a disciplinarian, I find them slack in certain cases. And I'll point one out before we finish the chapter here. Uh, knowing the Egyptian people uh, as well, especially in history and studying the people. 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one of, uh, one of the one was uh, Sifra, that means um, uh, means brightness. She was a bright person, bright eyes. In the name of the other, pure, which means splendid. Now, of course, a midwife for the Hebrew women. Th these were this was property. They were slaves, so naturally you got to take care of them. 
so these were basically the medical community, okay, uh, that uh, Pharaoh uh, appointed to take care of the Hebrew women, all right? That in itself shows compassion, all right? I got news for you. The Hebrew women did not need a midwife from Egypt to get by pretty good. Verse 16. And he said, this is being Pharaoh, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, I'll explain more, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Now, these stools were um, eben or oben in the Hebrew. This means the stones. And usually it was the two stones that where they sit and the baby was bathed there and made delivery rather easy, put them in the delivery position. And um, so um, uh, this was the place the rear birth was set up. And what, you know, now think about this order. And, and I'm sure that Pharaoh, when he gave this order, probably meant it. He's not going to hold to it. Lack of discipline? Well, I'm glad it was because this would have meant genocide. And this is nothing but Satan himself trying to, this would have been genocide, all right? Pure out and out genocide. Because naturally, if you were to have pulled away the male seed of Israel, nature itself, Pharaoh would have shipped in others, and you would have had Israel, that lineage through which Christ would come, uh, polluted to the point there would be no return. Same thing he tried with the fallen angels in, um, in way back at Genesis 6 in the garden, all right? <clears throat> Will it work? I don't know. Let's find out. Verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. So here we see through this attempt of Satan that God has done something to these women. Because to refute or to refuse to do what Pharaoh requested was certain death. They refused. Why? Because something... Uh, God himself took care of them, the same as he will take care of you today. Do you have faith? Do you know that? That's why these things were written, so that you would know that God has his hand on those he chooses and those that um, submit to him in faith to know that they're our fathers in charge. He's going to take care of you. All right, you can fight it. It's up to you. But that's why this is written, so that you know, and that's why I will call it the book of redemption, because God is going to redeem these people. Verse 18. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Uh-oh. And he said unto them, why have you done this thing and have saved the men, children, alive? Why have you done it? I mean, I mean here comes the, uh, the stoning, the stakes, the noose. I mean, they're dead women. 19. And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, because, listen carefully, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women. For they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. They, uh, in other words, if you know, all that, a wise person knows if we lose one son there, we ain't going back, okay? We're not going to get on them spools. All right, that's, they can have their rocks. We ain't going near those rocks. So they naturally gave birth themselves. They didn't need these midwives. Now, uh, ponder this a moment, though. Are, are the Egyptian midwives kind of stretching the truth here a little bit? I mean, they, God had to put the fear into them pretty much. What he's saying, what they're saying to Pharaoh is those women are so healthy, they just have those children and that's it. Now, I, I'm going to have to hold up for the Egyptian women have always been noted for giving easy birth, so that doesn't fly. But um, 
be that as it may. Now, sometimes it's not good to look uh, too much at the mechanics or the natural of a thing, but at the same time to deliver the spiritual, we have to. So think about it anyway. That's the reason I mention it. Verse 20. Now, and the point being, God has intervened. That should be obvious to you. Verse 20. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives. Who did? Pharaoh? No, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mightily. In other words, fulfilling the promise he had made to Abram that we covered as before verse 1, back in Genesis 15, verse 13, that they would be in captivity, exactly how long it would be, basically, and also that they would be very prosperous there. And so they were. And naturally, the quiver being full is one of the greatest riches of the people. Of course, they will have other riches as well from Egypt. They will collect their salaries quite well, if you know what I mean. 21. You will before we finish the book of Exodus, anyway. 21 reads, And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, not Pharaoh, feared God, that he made them houses. He made each one of those midwives themselves so popular and so prosperous that they had their and headed their own house. That the, the word in the Hebrew also means progeny, all right? That if they were to, if the Egyptian women to were to uh, work whereby the progeny of Israel could be increased. Certainly, God increased theirs. You can't outgive God, being the point. All right, God takes care of those that help His people, regardless of who they are. Why? We're all, even the Egyptian women, are God's children. So God takes care of those that um, facilitate His program. And let there be no doubt: these Egyptian women had no lack of faith in Almighty God, for they absolutely uh, outwitted. I'm, I was going to say uh, that they uh, lied to Pharaoh. No, they only outwitted him. They didn't really lie to him, because what they said is a true fact for that moment. Those women, in working so hard and everything else, had no problems with delivery. Just. Uh, and then that that they did, let's face it, our people are very intelligent. They can take care of themselves. But they feared God, I mean, they loved Him. So they naturally had the faith that they went against uh, Pharaoh, and God never forgets that type of faith. And He also strengthened their progeny because these midwives had helped strengthen His, that is to say, the house of Israel. 22. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Again, there he goes with his order of basically genocide. When you, this is Satan again. Now, <clears throat> we know that this order was given, but it wasn't rigorously enforced because it'll, it will go out the window very soon. Uh, it would seem that it's only at this one particular time which uh, brings forth Moses. Even Moses will be thrown into the river, but there'll be one difference. He'll have a little ark and, um, and a sister, and that wonderful sister is going to protect him. And you know, when you stop and think, if, if you, were you not to have faith in God to know that he took one Miriam and she was the only thing between the crocodiles and the Nile, Nile overlooking her little brother that, I mean, out there in the reeds floating in that river, I mean, one old crocodile come up one snap, and it's, it's over. But there it all hinges on one little old girl that God utilized. And, uh, of course, 
naturally we know that God was watching over him. But God uses people. Sometimes he chooses a little girl. Sometimes he may choose a little boy like David to bring down a giant. God's still in control, but he does use people that have faith. I know that in Miriam's heart, though she argued with Moses at times, hey, that's brothers, sisters, family, so be it. You know, that's, that's kind of natural to have a little bit of that. The beauty of it is being able to overcome arguments, you know, to solve them in-house, that is to say, in the family. And when the family can't solve their own, then you've got trouble. You've got a crippled, wounded family. So um, here we have it, and uh, I, I do want to say a word about coming out of Babylon. Many today would say, no, oh, well, uh, I certainly don't feel like that I'm in any slavery or anything. What do you think about usury? It's around, you know, and a lot of people get so involved in it that uh, they're, they're in chains, certainly in chains. Living on plastic, way to go, modern times. It, it, it's stupidity and it's stupid times. You know, if you can buy a washing machine for $200, why pay $500? Well, I wouldn't. Well, if you buy it on credit, you did. If you would have made the payments to yourself, uh, you would have come out of bondage. You see, the, Pharaoh was the one world system at this time. It's a type. I'm not stretching the truth or writing anything in. Don't live on plastic. If you've got to borrow money, go to a bank and get it for 8 or 9 or 10 percent or whatever, instead of paying 18 and up by plastic. You know, there, you don't need to go to a shark. The only people that can survive swimming with the sharks is somebody that's smarter than the sharks. So wake up and take care of yourself and think. You're going to see some stands of faith that are fantastic in this book of Exodus, the coming out. Let me tell you something. We're coming out of confusion. What brings us out? Our Father does. The same as He did as He promised in, in Genesis 15, 13, and 14. It is a thing of the mind as well as faith and love for our Father. He, it is written that we would come to this situation that we're in today that there would be a one world system. But to arise above it, all you had to do is be wiser than the sharks, okay? Of all types, political, religious, uh, the uh, economical, um, and uh, certainly the religious more so, political also four of them, the four hidden dynasties. You're supposed to be smarter than they are. Then you got no problem. Well, how do I do that? By being familiar with your Father's Word. Uh, I'm going to tell you what. A man, woman, or child that knows pretty well what, what the future is that can't beat the sharks is hurting bad for brain power. Okay? Now, it is not meant that all should be um, bankers or sharpies. We've got other things to do. It's more important to spread God's Word than it is to spend all that time. But I'm just saying, it's not a bad world. If you love the Father and He blesses you, you can multiply even under these conditions and do real good because we know what tomorrow brings. Okay? <clears throat> In other words, I'll oversimplify that simply by saying, if you have a copy of tomorrow's newspaper and the next day and the next day and the next year, you should be in pretty good shape, couldn't you? Shouldn't you? You should know pretty well what to do to overcome everything. There's no step for a stepper. That's why it's no problem for me to say every day in the Word is a good day. Why? It's a winner, okay? A real winner. Don't miss any of the lectures on the coming out. It's the way. And that way is Christ. Great lesson within it. Don't, don't miss any of them. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment.